Continue <laughs> because I hear my voice. <laughs> so good afternoon again. If you are not understanding Portuguese or Spanish, I would request to go and get your headphones. They are available outside. When you get out of this hall, they are on the left hand side. If you can manage Portuguese and Spanish, then you don't need it. We have translation. Please do it in uh, next five minutes because we don't want to. I have promised Pam that I'm not going to repeat the same mistakes as we did in Valencia. We are learning, evolving. So we, I want to start by 2.15. I just saw my friend Tung from Thailand. Tung, welcome. Terry, are you here? Terry was looking for Tung, right? Terry, you were looking for Tung? You found her? Good, good. So please get your headphones and we are going to start in three minutes. So let me again um, while everyone is getting ready and getting the headphones, let me uh, again share why this event is a little different. This is real event by the industry for the industry. And steadily, nothing happens in one day. Steadily it is becoming more by the industry for the industry. I am hardcore agriculture professional and I want to build this community as fast as as strong as possible and in doing that the total agenda has been again you will see the that it is developed very much by the professionals we have divided the agenda into two and a half days once again that was the second learning point because last time it was rush 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 we didn't have enough time so instead of two days we decided to make it two and a half days and give more time for the networking so one thing you will notice that this time coffee breaks are one hour lunch breaks are two hours so you get a lot of entertainment and a lot of networking time and evening time also we have three hours this is from the learning curve. And whatever we are learning here, we are going to further execute next year. And uh, our team, our partners, will invite you to the next year program during the gala dinner. When we talk about putting these events together, you know that what you saw upstairs and what you are seeing here we cannot ever, ever do it without our sponsors and partners. We call them partners. So I really want to t thank our top tier partners, Compo Expert, Rovensa Next, Biotrope, and Kimitech. At the same time, if you see the next slide, you will notice that the whole industry is supporting. There is no doubt that some people may not have found out about it and the more and more people are finding out and it's becoming more one of those events thanks Alejandro for uh, mentioning that that this is becoming one of those events people are putting in their calendars so thanks for the support of all the sponsors at the same time we cannot call ourselves by the industry for the industry if we don't have our industry partners media partners with us as well 
We don't only need the commercial partners. So if you look at this screen, including partners like Business France, of course, our Brazilian partner, our uh, event partner, Crop Life, AB, AB Solo, then Business France. Just in Brazil alone, we have almost every industry association is supporting us. At the same time, we have also invited our press people and I will request all the leaders of the industry, when you are contacted by the press people, please oblige them by sharing your views how we can build this bioag community stronger and faster together. A lot of people talked to me when they looked at a poster outside about the Bioag World Academy. The reason I put it here first before I put the next slide so I can highlight it a little more that this whole industry is moving towards knowledge gap and how to fill the knowledge gap. So us at Global Bioag Linkages, we have started four pillars. Roberto, our total business is all about sharing knowledge, networking. So we do one event a year to bring the whole community together, to make it like a carnival for knowledge share and networking. At the same time, we have also started a magazine. Thanks for all your support. That magazine has become one of the sought after magazine. People who are from the chemical industry, seed industry, fertilizer industry, they know that there are dedicated big magazines. But our bioag industry, we never had a magazine. It was always some portals. They are generally covering chemicals and fertilizers and seeds. Then they are adding bioag because bioag is the new thing. But no one is dedicated to the bioag. So we started Bioag World Digest. And now we are also starting Bioag World Academy, where through our research, we are identifying what are the real gaps in the industry, bioag industry, and especially in making sustainable farming practices mainstream. Then once we identify those gaps, then we sit down with our mentors and guides, and, and uh, I would say that uh, almost uh, leaders of the industry who have led the industry for the last 20, 30 years, and we develop modules for those gaps. So this time, the four modules we are launching on Friday, they are, one of them is by Pam Marone, our legend of the industry, all of you know Pam. We will talk more about Pam in the session number nine. I'm very excited about that. Then also, Marcus Meadow Smith, who has transformed some businesses and made a lot of success stories. At the same time, we also have Dan Custis, who exited successfully a few years ago. He said to me, Roger, I'm not done yet. What do I do with all this knowledge I have? I said, Dan, welcome aboard. Let's do something together. And then, of course, we have Giuseppe Cola, who I can tell you that is a walking, talking encyclopedia on biostimulants. You will hear from him a lot. So that's how we are starting the academy. We are going to add more and more modules. We are going to add another module on the microbiome with, by Dr. K.R.K. Reddy, who is also here. Uh, K.R.K., are you here? Not yet. K.R.K. is here, who is going to launch his own module. So I just wanted to share with you how we are moving into this direction to bring the whole community together and try to fill the gap with the passion. When we talk about the passion, Antonio gave me a little bit of a hint about Roberto Rodriguez, our uh, chief guest for today. Unfortunately, he has to go tonight. But after spending some time with you, Roberto, I can tell you I will miss you in the samba dances tonight. I think you would have really enjoyed it. Roberto has a very, very rich background, and it will be injustice for me to talk about Roberto, because Roberto has so many friends here, and one of those is Antonio Zem, 
who is our host partner tonight. And today, I want him to introduce Roberto Rodriguez and do the justice to what Roberto Rodriguez is. So, Antonio, thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Okay, first of all, welcome to Brazil, to the fastest growing biological market in the world. So we are in the right place at the right momentum. When Roger asked me to bring a name, it was immediately Dr. Roberto Rodriguez. And I have the honor and the privilege to introduce the top leader on the agribusiness in Brazil. He is an agronomist by famous Escola Superior de Agricultura, Luis de Queiroz. He's a grower himself. He produces sugarcane, soybean, corn, cattle. I may miss one or two crops. He has been professor at UNESP for many, many years and has been teaching many, many generations of top-notch agronomists in Brazil, many of them today here. He also is a professor in the Brazilian Business School, FGV. He was Secretary of Agriculture for the Sao Paulo State, and he was the Minister of Agriculture during the first period of President Lula in Brazil. He is a very, very, very uh, inspiring leader. He has been all the time ahead of his time, bringing inspiration. I read his article almost every week, uh, weekend he put in newspapers, always touching subject that maybe many of us don't have the courage, the, the spirit to really bring it up. He defends agriculture, he loves agriculture, he likes the sustainable agriculture. So. If I keep saying, oh, I cannot forget, he, he has an incredible work behind the cooperatives, cooperative system in Brazil. And he led the, the Global Agriculture, uh, Cooperative uh, Federation of Agriculture, global, I said, is the world impact. So he's an incredible, incredible person. I mean, by sure, he's going to inspire all of us this, this afternoon. It's a great opening to this great event. Ladies and gentlemen, with you, Dr. Roberto Rodriguez. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I have to thank Roger for this invitation to come here with you, and mainly Antonio Zem. See, the best thing in the world is getting good friends. Good friends say good things about us, so they don't pay attention to the bad issues, just to the good issues. So I'm very happy to be a friend of uh, Antonio Zem. And thank you, Roger, for this chance to talk to you. But I don't speak English. But I speak English like Tarzan used to do. You remember Tarzan? You're too young. Tarzan was uh, uh, my hero during 50 years ago. But I, I, I speak English like him, so I prefer to speak in Portuguese. So please, I ask you to put your audiphones to, because I'm going to speak in Portuguese. And I, I miss Jane. Jane was wonderful at that time. <laughs> Bom, o Roger e o Zen me pediram para conversar com os senhores sobre a evolução da agricultura brasileira nos últimos anos e por que é fundamental que os produtos biológicos tenham cada vez mais peso nesse setor importante 
da economia brasileira. Então, vou tentar mostrar isso com um pouco de leveza, para não cansar-os muito com a minha fala. Ah, passado com uma bipolaridade global caracterizada por, por um lado, o Ocidente, com países ricos, poderosos, fortes, mas sem liderança e, portanto, sem projeto. Do outro lado, a China, que tem uma liderança impressionante, tem projeto, estratégia e constrói um modelo importante de, de poder é, no mundo todo. Essa, essa polaridade está é, tirando protagonismo das principais organizações multilaterais. A própria ONU, FAO, OMC, perguntar na rua quem é o diretor-geral da OMC ou da FAO, quem é o secretário executivo da ONU, ninguém sabe. As instituições estão perdendo protagonismo porque o Ocidente está perdendo liderança e elas são de inspiração ocidental. Então, a gente, te, a gente percebe que essa divisão é complicada para nós, Brasil, porque nós somos um país ocidental e hoje dependente fundamentalmente da China e da Ásia em termos comerciais. A agricultura, particularmente, depende intrinsecamente da China e da Ásia, como todos sabem muito bem. Então, nós temos uma condição interessante né, de dificuldades e de oportunidades. É difícil estar no mundo ocidental dependendo da China, mas ao mesmo tempo, as três principais, os três principais desafios da humanidade do século XXI são segurança alimentar, a questão energética e a questão climática, são os três temas principais da humanidade nesse século XXI e nós temos uma convicção de que os três temas passarão pela agricultura, segurança alimentar é óbvio, energia também, mas aí a questão climática evidentemente tem a ver com a agricultura. Então, esses três temas terão que passar pela agricultura de uma forma ou de outra. Mas qual a agricultura? A agricultura tropical do planeta. Quem é que está na área tropical do planeta, agrícola falando? A América Latina inteirinha, toda a África subsaariana, uma boa parte da Ásia também, porque é nessa faixa territorial do planeta que tem terra para aumentar a produção horizontalmente e é onde a tecnologia ainda é baixa, é preciso crescer verticalmente a produtividade. Então, é nessa grande faixa que o crescimento da agricultura de alimentos, de energia e de fibras vai realmente acontecer. Não obstante, outras regiões do planeta também terão um crescimento basicamente por causa da tecnologia. Mas esse território uh, tropical é onde nós imaginamos que vai haver um grande espaço de crescimento. E, Provavelmente, development and Brasil. probably uh, Brazil will be the leader in this process, not only in producing this food, but showing uh, to the tropical world what we are doing here. And this can repeat it in other tropical regions, in Africa especially, with its safety because the The environment is similar to Brazil and its war is expanding in the last 30 years. Uh, Brazilians, we know that, uh, but Brazil, 50 years ago, in the 70s, 
we used to import 30% of what we consume here in Brazil. We would import uh, rice, milk, and meat. It was the military regime. We had the strategy to be able to conquer the territory, and Brazil had a central part that was in it was empty part of Brazil and its population and its economy. No one used to live there in the center west in Brazil. And naturally, this region that is located here, it was empty, no population, no economy. And there was this saying that the agriculture from the south that would work with fertile uh, part they were not they didn't had i'm not sure if they will be able to translate this sentence but the people from the the savannah here in brazil they would say that they would wouldn't be able to grow anything in this region however in 1973 Embrapa was created. Our own research body, which immediately dedicated itself to dominate the Cerrado vegetation. We started learning how to produce in the Cerrado region, and we set up a, a set of governmental programs destined to conquer the Cerrado. We called them Polo Centro, and the other was called Protecer. We had a partnership even with the Japanese government. These two programs created a diaspora in Brazil, through which small farmers, overall uh, those with German and Italian origins, they started migrating there. They started acquiring many hectares of land and set up the belt of agriculture that we see today. And it is this tropical agriculture that we learned how to do that we hope to turn into a universal project in the tropical belt. And at the same time, have a, an important position in selling food energy and fibers to the world and this has been happening across the last few years with some regularity so the work done by OECD which later was uh, assessed by USGA it stated well you must all know the work that the UN did at the beginning of the century aiming for 2050 there was an estimate that until 2050, so in about half a century, we would need to increase food production in 60% across the whole world. This wasn't considered as much because, well, any forecast above 5 to 10 years is pretty much unfeasible in its accuracy because we just... the the fast growth and change of the world doesn't allow for that type of forecast. So we started looking at 10 years. And we saw that in 10 years, the worldwide supply of food needed to increase in 20% in order to feed the population. It seems easy or easier, but it is not. Because the US was supposed to grow 10%, Europe 12%, so, Eurasia, China, Russia, Ukraine, nobody would grow 20%. So, the study, the studies done by OECD and FAO stated that for the world to grow 20% in the worldwide supply of food in 10 years, Brazil needs to grow 41%. I want to call your attention that to the fact that this is work that Brazil was not a part of. We didn't participate in that work. So these is international academies that reached that conclusion, which makes us proud, but also concerned because uh, they stated that Brazil could grow 
twice as much as the world in 10 years for three reasons sustainable technology available land and manpower basically so this is only grains grain production in brazil from the 90s to this day in 1990 was the year of the color plan a crazy president we had who created a plan which allowed the first possible advancement to fight inflation in the world and i'm a rural producer i was born into agriculture and tend to die in it in at least 20 years i'm 80 at least i'm, I'm hoping to live for at least 20 more so back then over half of my income came from overnight so it was much better to have a good friend in a bank than to have a good agronomist in an office but with a stable economy we it was necessary to seek technology to remain competitive and this curve shows that very clearly these clear green columns are planted is planted soil in grains in brazil and it grew 103 percent this curve is the grain production in brazil it grew over 300 percent so grain production grew four times as much as planted soil because of te developed technology which was applied by farmers this is sustainable technology by the way why so we cultivate 77 million hectares 77 and we actually only cultivate 51 of them we were able to in this country create a technical condition that allows us to create to have three harvests in the same year in the same area which implicates the consumption of agrochemicals which is the theme that brings us to this room today and this is the essential conversation no other tropical country in the world has done two harvests a year in the same plot in the same land and we do so today we throughout the year cultivate 77 million hectares so if we had today the technology we had in 1990 we would need about 121 million hectares more to reach this number we did not deforest 121 million hectares because the productivity of planted areas they replaced the demand for new land this is in fact de facto sustainability this is our commitment to the future it is not an environmentalist dream it is a concrete achievement of brazilian agronomy now i need to do some self-promotion i know it's ugly but since i'm here in front of you i won't miss this chance i here is when i was the minister of agriculture there was some growth but after that it grew so much my mom always says that the the best minister of agriculture ever was the one who did this so, anyway with a proper public policy so this wasn't just for grains also for livestock so meat meat is either grains or feedstock this is what happened to bovines it doubled it has a slower biological cycle the process of uh, raising livestock is slower but swines and chicken here 500 percent more chicken across 30 years chicken means eggs corn soy and it flies a little bit more so in order to be good at chicken you need to be good at soy and grains so corn for every other culture that we look at this curve repeats so brazilian science brazilian biology and agronomy geneticists they created a spectacular process 
for productive agriculture in a sustainable manner. We'll go back to this further on. But it's not just in food. This is why I talked about the energy issue as a center issue for humanity. Brazil has 44% of its energy matrix as renewable energy. The world has 14. And is it, it is 14 because Brazil is part of the world. So this is a piece of data that the people are usually aware of. But what people are usually not aware of is that out of these 44, 16 comes from agriculture. So sugarcane ethanol, corn, biodiesel from soy, but not just that. Electricity generated from uh, sugarcane, from alcohol, the biomethane that is used in chicken and livestock, it has electric energy that moves the whole industry. So the parcel of biomass included in the Brazilian matrix is higher than the renewable parcel of the whole world. So that is why we believe that we can contribute to the change of the worldwide energy matrix with the use of intense agriculture. So I'm uh, an agronomist and a farmer. I could talk to you about this until next Monday, but we have a short amount of time. And I just like to mention that we have a plan called ABC. So low carbon agriculture, as it translates. We have several projects. So direct purchase of hay, full integration, which we launched. So these are all themes which are uh, occupying millions of hectares in Brazil. And this is quite a recent program. The crop plans of each year, they allocate resources with subsidized funds to those who work with low carbon agriculture in order to fulfill the commitment established by Brazil in COP15 which every day, every year that rather, we ratify. So regenerative agriculture is an essential theme for us. So we reached the point we reached today because of technology, entrepreneurship, and public policy. And this brings us to a relevant demand in the change of technological behavior, because this is a demand of consumers across the world. We need to be more sustainable in rural production, which is what the world demands of us. So the idea here is to work more intensely with regenerative agriculture with the use of biological feedstock. This you're very much aware of. And the principles that govern the regenerative agriculture, they basically include the seeking of high nutritional density food, which are free of contaminants, which do not reach um, under, um, underground, underground water, groundwater rather. And we're moving towards a green economy. And the bridge to, to towards that is called decarbonization. During the pandemic, it was bombarded and we, it lost some speed, but it's coming back with a lot more vigor and competency than it had in the past. So these themes, they truly are essential. And this is a stance of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. It states that we need to increase the income in up to $70 billion until 2040 with the return that it's still slow, but in the long term, there will be a lot of return. I'm from the city of Sao Paulo. I'm a farmer from there. But for 25 years now, 
we've been investing in Maranhão, the state in the northeastern region of Brazil. A very low producing um, area. The land is very acid. We spent more on that with anything else. There was a lot of limestone investment there. And today we joke with our grandchildren who are also agronomists because we can see a lot of worms in the land, which is a demonstration that the land was made with biological products. So I'm not just preaching with negative knowledge. This is a practice that was, uh, that's applied in several regions of the country. So all these themes, so direct planting, reduction of plowing. This is a project we launched with the Embrapa Research. What is the integration of livestock and crops? Brazil is quite a large country, so a large portion of it, in a large portion of it, it rains during winter. We could have a summer crop of soy and corn. We harvest it, and in the same land, we can use it for the winter crop, which is um, includes many other products. And we're advancing on that. Just so you have an idea, for corn, already 75% of its production is done in the second harvest, in the summer harvest. It is quite recent. In 2003, we developed the mini corn harvest because there was a lack, of, a lack of corn for livestock. And that year we created, um, we, we increased the production of corn significantly. So when there's an area in which it rains during winter, we conduct two crops. So soy, cotton, wheat, and corn. But there are areas in Brazil where it does not rain during winter. So Embrapa developed this, this next plan. We planted the summer crop and we seeded a second uh, second grain crop before the cycle ended so that when winter begins there's another there's already another plant which will give rise to the next crop and we're adding a third one and then we can already start planting the feedstock for the livestock production then soy begins again and the land is fully used so all of these systems so integrated management of pests irrigation systems these are all moving forward very quickly in brazil it has been growing quite significantly Biofeedstock has been growing over 75% a year, which is more than double than what the world grows. So, rural producers in Brazil, they have their own features. When they see something positive for the technical activities and their economical activities as well, they invest very quickly. The integration was launched in 2005. There's already 15 million hectares in, in Brazil with that integration process already at work. When they see advantages for the soil, producers almost unanimously, they are sure that they, they either preserve the soil or they just lose everything. So they really take good care of it. This data I'm sure you're aware of, I won't waste too much time on it, is it shows how quickly we've been advancing in Brazil, a lot quicker than in the world, and with a growing trend overall with the crop plants.
the government is implementing crop plans for this year. And the basis of it is regenerative agriculture. There will be very cheap credits for those who use it. This is the past crop for last year. 20% of planted soy had bio feedstock, 52% of sugarcane, 26% of corn, 64% of cotton. It is advancing a lot quicker than even we thought was possible. So very well. I told you in the beginning that OECD and FAO, they truly believe that Brazil is able to grow 40% in 10 years in order for the world to grow half of that. The first point of that is technology. The second reason is land. This is from Embrapa, our research organization. It shows that Brazil has 66% of its territory fully available to agriculture. This is impressive in such a size. So 66% is quite a large area. 32% of this area it's in the Brazilian farms, private farms, because we have a very rigorous uh, legislation that to conserve this that demands a part of the agricultural area that it's called a permanent preservation area that varies from region to region. In the Amazon, it's 80%, in the South is 20%, and the Savannah is 35% or it's called legal reserve that it's we we need to conserve with native forests in brazil so the legislation allows that the legal reserve to be included at the app this this protection area that it's 60 percent of the total area that exists so all of the farmers in brazil that are they have to they need to have this uh reserve and the important part is this number here this small yellow triangle here in the south s of the globe is the planted area that is going to be planted with any agricultural product of brazil but it cannot be grass anything from lettuce fr to Eucalyptus is going to occupy only 9% of our territory. And this uh, pasture is more than 21%. So we have some space to grow here horizontally in the Brazilian agriculture. But it's not easy because the forest, uh, the code is going to have the very rigorous deforestation legislation. So what's happening today is this changing from pasture to agriculture so basically is this the growth of the meat and milk production in the pasture it's so extraordinary that we need less pasture to produce more meat and milk and this uh, areas that were uh, degraded they are becoming agriculture in this integration with the agriculture so the sector that it's it was this uh, meat business and the agriculture that one that planted grants, it's having pasture and he's having uh, plantations and pasture at the same time. So they are very, having this very competitive business in Brazil. And only 9% of the national territory, 9% of the entire territory are occupied with any Brazilian crop. And we are the biggest, uh, we are exporting coffee, soil, orange juice, meat, uh, chicken, and others. And second one, it's corn turn and pork and others with the very considerable due to this Brazilian forest code. So the two teams, technology and area, that are the most important teams that in the Brazilian territory. And the third one is people. We don't have a lot of numbers to show you about people, but I want to show you myself. 
I was the president of the national alliance in different cooperatives. I, I visit a few countries in Europe and outside Europe. And until today, I'm part of a few agricultural academies outside Brazil. A few years ago, I think I was around 74, 75 years old, and I went to an event in Eco Provence. And I went to uh, do a presentation for French agricultures. And I went there, it was early. I got to the director's uh, room and to wait for the audience to be full. And then they got full and they called me to do the presentation. When I got in with 74 years old, I was the youngest in that room. And I was amazed by that. And I asked, uh, is there anyone there to watch my presentation and they went to the nursery and they got they went to um, a hospital and got old people to listen to me and they said no because Europe is getting old here in Brazil usually we have uh, one work in a farmer with 46 47 and in Europe they are older and this it's changing due to our technology and then because of the pandemic, because the pandemic uh, had this digitalization process. So young people that deal with computers and they are faster with this technology, they are going through the agriculture. And we had this ongoing advance uh, in this productivity. So nowadays we go to a farm anywhere in Brazil. You have a 25 years old woman in the computer. She knows the price of soil in Chicago, uh, how much it is a ship to go to China to get this, what's the rate to get on board. She knows if it's raining in Argentina. So they have a lot of information and precise information to get faster decision makings and to get a faster and more consistent uh, uh, growth. So here in Brazil, uh, and when I go to Asia, I'm always the youngest. Here in Brazil, unfortunately, wherever I go, I'm always the oldest. That it's bad for me, of course, but it's great for Brazil to have. I, I can see this audience. I can see former students. Uh, my my children, uh, friends that are continue this bioeconomy and uh, is still going continue to is going to continue to grow and this allow us to talk about the importance of this agribusiness is an important sector in the Brazilian economy okay, so thank you if they ask me why I'm not speaking English I I prefer to speak Portuguese I speak French a little bit is not that I I'm very I'm, I'm not going to keep talking in my Tarzan English so I rather speak Portuguese so the agribusiness in Brazil was one uh, one fourth of the Brazilian uh, GDP it generated many uh, positions in Brazil and exported 48%, half of the exportations in Brazil. So remember these numbers. The value of the exports last year in Brazil, 48%, half of it is in agriculture. And I will come back to this number, but what is more important is this line here. It's, we have 25% we have 7% of the, gen the general uh, GDP of Brazil. It, this is in farming, so we have uh, farming, agribusiness, distribution, and this is where we need to get because we have a small number of the total cost with the, agri with the supplies and have this importance in this technology and in this uh, legislation that we want because we need to get more and more with more uh, come out with more inputs and here is where we have this cooperative that will allow the small producers to access the same technology that the the others have these numbers are for from this year 
the Brazilian economists believe that Brazil will grow less than 1% in the national D GDP. Uh, agribusiness will grow 8%. And we know this for many years, we are supporting this Brazilian GDP, but this year the difference is higher. And you can see those data here. In the year 2000, agribusiness uh, were 21 21%. Last year was six times higher. So those numbers are amazing because in the middle of the way we have the economical crisis in 2008, 9 and 10 and agribusiness growth eight times during this time. And this is an important feature. The soil in the 2000 was 21, 20% of 20 billions of dollars. Last year, soil was 40% of 160. I graduated 56 years ago at Piracicaba and Brazil had 400 hectares of soil, 400 producing 1,200 1, kilos per hectare. Now we have 44 million hectares. This is a revolution and it's amazing. I'm going to give you a few numbers and we took 500 years to produce 100 million uh, grants in 2001. 14 years later, in 2015, we produced 200 million. This year, eight years after, 300 million. So, one thing that it's growing 100 million in eight years. So, there's numbers that gave us the expectation to to be relevant in the global process. So uh, where are we standing all of those? In 2000, 59% was uh, European Union and United States. Last year, only 23%. 60% of 20 is less than 23 of 160. So we increased those exports in European Union and United States. And it's simple to explain because China in 2000 was 2% of our market and now it's 32%, but 2.7 of 20 and 32% of 160. So you imagine how much it grown in these exports, in the, Bra uh, the Brazilian exportation in the last 20 years. And Asia from eight, well, 11 to 17, Africa from 3 to 5, 5.9%. And shows an obvious thing in the world. The, ongo the, the development countries that are the ones that are growing and the demand growth. So Brazil was able to uh, get this ongoing uh, demand throughout the world, especially in the Africa and Asia uh, region. And with this, let's look only this uh, right numbers that it's the, the commercial, the Brazilian commercial uh, results. And we have the dark blue, the, the balance that we had. The dark blue are the positive that it's still growing. And the light blue are the other sectors that are also exporting but importing more. So it's the negative balance that we have. And this line is the balance of the country that is positive thanks to agribusiness that last year generated $160 billion and the other uh, sectors had a deficit of $80 billion. That's why we export 40% of this value. And the this balance is higher than this because we have this uh, balance of $300 billion thanks to agribusiness. And by saying that, to finish our conversation, we have two questions. Okay, so we expect to increase in 10 years almost 40%. Is this possible? It is possible because what brought us here today was technology, people, 
and public policies. The three programs are still happening in, with the international marketing growing. But are we going to grow 40%? I'm not sure. I have my questions because unfortunately we don't have any strategy, a uh, complete strategy to get there. So uh, government and the society, they, we don't have a clear image of what is going to happen. I have been working with this for many years, thinking about this complete st strategy to conf to take into consideration the logistics and infrastructures. Uh, in the 80s, agriculture went to the south, uh, center west of the, and the savanna of the, of the Brazilian savanna. And, but uh, we didn't have the, the roads, we didn't have the ports, and we have this deficit in this structure. And it's something that government cannot uh, fix because they don't have the money to do that. So we need uh, public-private partnerships. And those partnerships will only happen if the investors are sure that they're going to have the payback of their investments. And this will need some structural uh, changes that are ongoing and are very slow in this and they need to advance to be able to solve this the second point it's uh, revenue policy that we need that has to do with the stability the technical stability and we need a position in the Brazilian that we need this uh, safety and I think it was in 2003 and 20 years after we have less than 15% of the Brazilian area that it's safe and it's secure so we are fighting for to get this so this next crop will have a bigger resource that we had in the previous years and this uh, rural uh, insurance man ins it's going to attract the private investors and we have this it's going to get this technology is going to bring this technology and will add in this uh, directions and we also need this international uh, coverage we know that 40 percent of this market happens in this agreement just a minute No, it's okay. It's you can leave it here. Talking about agriculture, it's get us warm. So, uh, and today's we don't have enough uh, commercial agreements nowadays. In this last time, the government went to China last month. We, we depend on this commercial agreements because it's going to assure the market, it's going to uh, help us and we need, we are able to negotiate this in a few years and we need those market and I, I'm from a time in the 50s last year that we were the biggest coffee producers and the price was so low that we throw a whole ship of uh, coffee in the oceans and i don't want to do that with soil because i don't know what's going to happen with the soil and the 100 million growth that we had in last year it's a line of uh, trucks as uh, six times the line of trucks from Porto Alegre to uh, to other cities, and we need these international agreements because we know that this is growing in Europe and United States, and this protection that I consider to be uh, 
I consider to be a little bit hypocrite because the Europeans they defend, they have this neo protectionist based on the the environment defense. Everyone, it's uh, it's there is no one that is against the environment. But when you talk about the commercial side of it, it's not the same. So it's a bit hypocritical in my view. Border carbon project is interesting with the objective of defending the environment, but defending it from whom? It is obviously a project of making the, uh, the labor more expensive, which limits the growth of Brazilian agronomy. So anyway, let's take care of the environment as it sh should be cared for and not with a fake impression. On the other hand, Fruits, for example, we are the third largest producer of fruit, but the and here we have so much biofeedstocks, so we need a policy that's consistent. We can grow so much milk, we export less than Uruguay, which was a state of Brazil in the past. Fish, Brazil is the fourth largest producer of some species of fish and certainly does not export as much as it could. We can increase a lot in terms of fish culture. It is growing, but it's still very small. We need to increase in terms of biofeedstock. And these are themes that really have an effect on production chains and we must increase exporting. But fertilizers as well. This is obvious to us. We import 85% of what we use in terms of fertilizers. And we have so many compounds that we can use here. And we're growing very quickly. So you, you could visit the countryside of Sao Paulo and, and see we're, we're creating so many different fertilizer compounds. So all of that will continue to move forward, but we need to consider the fact of sustainability as a synonym of competitiveness. And therefore, biofeedstock, it's, it's so obvious, it's very obvious math. And Brazilian farmers have noticed that, and we are doing it with a lot of competency. Obviously, there are issues. Brazil is like a it's not like a Disneyland of agriculture. Unfortunately, we have a lot of mistakes, which are not committed by farmers. The first one is illegal deforestation which grew uh, exponentially in the Amazon region. It is an outrage. It is an unacceptable. Farmers don't accept it. We need the Brazilian state, the Brazilian government to take care of it, to really inspect it. It is hard. There is lack of access. There are hurdles. But for sure, it can be done. It is an outrage. In the same way that fires are unacceptable. It generates so much loss. This is terrible. Invasion is unacceptable. Private land, it is private property. Our constitution prohibits it. Public land is public. These are being invaded and we need the state to take care of it. Um, there's the agrarian issue, the lack of property and credit access because of it. So these are all themes that have to do with legality. Brazil needs to put a stop to everything that's illegal.
because our competitors they're losing market shares to us what do they do they use illegal deforestation the agrarian issue the fires the anyway all of it against agriculture they know our farmers don't do it but they use it in, to against us and we need to change it in order for the truth to triumph and for our laws to triumph and I'd just like to wrap up with one last point I was the president of the Brazilian Association of Agriculture, of Agribusiness. I was the president of about 15 public bodies related to agriculture. And for a long period of time, I've questioned myself on the urban sustainability of, um, of our cities. And obviously, if we have an issue with somebody, they, this somebody can get angry to us. So the more I struggled with it, the harder it became until something was something changed. An amazing woman called Catherine Deneuve, a French actress, she's beloved across the world. She got the Molière Prize, and as she I was making her thanks, she thanked the French ag farmers, and they asked her, why? Uh, 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 such a beloved figure, how can you dedicate a movie-related prize to, to farmers? You can find it in the internet. And she said, well, I am alive. Who feeds us? Who feeds our society? Who provides us with clothes and perfumes? It is the French farmers. And therefore, how can I decorate the roles that I play in movies? So everything that I am, everything that I've become, I owe to farmers. I just am feed the French so much. The French farmers, they really, you know, it was extraordinary. Why aren't you Brazilian, Catherine Deneuve? And why can't you, you raise awareness over here? So I just became aware of the stupidity of fighting against and criticizing urban agriculture. I'm a farmer. A soil seed that I plant was generated by an agronomist or a geneticist or a biologist who graduated in an urban university in the city. So they, they trained the technician and, you know, and they planted with a machine manufactured in the urban industry with credit provided to me by urban banks with an urban insurance our storage houses, our roads, these are all built by engineering companies that come from the urban context. So therefore, I can't exist without the urban context. I can only plant soy because the city plants the feedstock necessary for that to be possible. The workers in each industry, they work for agriculture and they don't even know it. A tire manufacturer, they work for me. So, trucks are very important for my harvest. And now I know this. I cannot exist without the city. And the city allows me to plant. I plant, I treat, and I harvest. I take my crops to storage houses and take them to the city. Or to um, a manufacturing plant who will package that for the urban markets to be sold in supermarkets in cities to export it through a port that's in cities so therefore 
in order to plant, we depend on cities and to, to, for selling as well. And the cities, without me, they, can, they would starve. So therefore, the urban and rural context, they are two sides of the same coin. And the Brazilian society demands cleaner products, healthier products, and more sustainable products. And that is why the Brazilian agronomy is taking a bet on biofeedstock. Because we want to be the worldwide champions of food security. Because we have the conviction that there can be no peace where there is hunger. If we eradicate starvation, we can multiply peace across the world. I want my grandchildren to be worldwide champions of peace across the world. And that is why I'm here with you. Thank you. you something I was when I was talking to Antonio I said Antonio when we go to a new country we talk about the, the country in detail the trends the agriculture the what is going to happen with the farmers sustainability he said we have one stop shop let's go to Roberto Rodriguez and, told, <laughs> and you have shown us that in one presentation I hope you agree with me we captured almost everything we could have captured in three speakers. So thank you so much. I really, really appreciate. Uh, I think we will wait for the questions uh, when we have the coffee break. But what I, if with your permission, I would like to do is translate this into English, as well as we keep in Portuguese, we keep two versions. And if you allow, I would like to share this with our audience because there's so much value in this. So, thank you so much. Uh, Our next speaker has a lot to do. After managing more than 500, 600 people, raising $165 million venture, doing a lot of variety of things, finally is going to manage or managing Syngenta Biologicals slash Velagro. I always thought that I travel a lot, but I want to ask my next speaker, my friend, Corey Huck, how did he manage and is he safely married after seven weeks being on the road? Corey. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. And uh, also a quick, uh, sincere thank you to Dr. Rodriguez. We uh, certainly uh, subscribe to the regenerative uh, agriculture uh, concept. I think we're at the front end of it and there's still a lot to, a lot to go um, and a lot to learn together. Um, why am I here? I, you know, every now and then you have to stop yourself and say, well, why am I on the stage in Rio in one of the greatest agricultural countries in the world speaking to you? And uh, for me, there's two parts of it. Uh, first, it's very personal. And second of all, it's a great opportunity to really make an impact on the world and on the food that all of us eat. So I wanted to share today a little bit on uh, a little bit of who I am and why this is important to me. And I think a lot of other people in this room can connect to that. And the second one is what do we need to do together and where do we see the future uh, of, of what we call this third way, uh, which is a term that I learned from my Villagro colleagues about uh, two and a half years ago, uh, which is about not a world that's just synthetic chemistry or synthetic fertilizer in the world or just biologicals, but it's a world where we integrate these different technologies on the farm and give the farmer uh, as many possible tools to grow 
and produce food in a very regenerative way. Oops, we lost, I think we lost the slides here. Maybe, sorry, there we go. So let me start with this. Uh, I think it was brought up uh, and, and explained very well. The challenges of farming are much different today uh, than they were uh, 40 years ago or even five years ago. And as you see on the left side of the slide, you know, everything from you know, droughts in China to overheat uh, in Europe, um, all the way to uh, fires in the United States, the challenges of producing are only getting more difficult. On the right side is where it gets a little bit more personal. So what you see on the top uh, slide there, my far family farm um, is still operational. It's in Nebraska. And if anybody knows anything about the United States, it's like right in the middle, and it's not anywhere close to water. It's like furthest away from water that you can possibly get. And my, uh, my family, uh, I'm only a second generation um, American uh, farmer, and my, uh, my father and my grandfather are sitting on the wheat drill there. And then that's me, just to prove that I can actually operate a tractor on the bottom one. So that is me uh, operating a tractor as a young, younger, much younger person. Um, and then on the, uh, the far uh, left side, or your right side, sorry, is the center pivot. So all of our, everything's gravity, irrig or everything's uh, pivot irrigated on our, on our farm. And it's dry, dry beans, so uh, pinto beans, kin kidney beans, and then corn is what we produce on our farm. But the reason I bring these pictures up is the way that that farm has changed from the time I was a young kid and my dad got me out of bed at 5.30 in the morning to go out and do chores, to where it is now, and I called my brother uh, just a few years ago, or I'm sorry, a few days ago, and uh, I said, how has farming changed on our farm? Now, I'm not there every day, I'm, as Roger pointed out, I'm usually traveling somewhere, and I don't get a chance to really see it firsthand. And uh, you know, it used to be once every two or three or five years, you might get a hailstorm and lose one part of the field. Uh, hail is, is something pretty, pretty common out there. But he says now every year, at least one half of the farm has some sort of an impact. In this case, it was heavy winds, threw the pivots over, had to replace them all. Um, over uh, drought, it's a very droughty area, or over flooding, he said every year at least half of the farm gets impacted somewhere, somehow. So climate change is real, and it's hitting farmers, and this is just my little story, and there's stories all around the globe that mimic this. Um, I did have the opportunity to travel in India a few weeks ago and in Iowa last week. And I will tell you from my personal uh, conversations and being on the farm, this is not unique to my family farm. Uh, this challenge is, is, is unique. So I asked myself, why am I sitting here in Rio and why is this important to me? And I want to share a little bit of the, the story of, of the company and a little bit of, of the background, why I think it's important. So as we know, these are not su surprising numbers. 70% of water is touched uh, or touched by agriculture one way or another. So we are stewards of the water. We must be better stewards of the water. The second one is the increased productivity from uh, or decreased uh, from uh, productivity from degraded land. Um, this is a little more uh, stark when you get into areas where the soil has been over fertilizer. I'll use two examples, China and India in particular. The soil degradation to where years and years of the best answer to anything agriculture production was put more fertilizer on, it has, it has long-term effects to the soil. So degraded land is a really big challenge. And then this, we need to increase uh, the carbon in the soil. soil. So 23% of today's greenhouse gases are as an output of agriculture. So we are part of the problem. We know the problem and the problem is us. So we are, certainly have some, some challenges ahead of us. So this was mentioned earlier, but this population increase now above 8 billion people, we just read, reached that a few months ago at the end of the last year. And not only that, by 2050, we have to produce 50% more crops, and we're going to have to do it in a more sustainable way. There's not going to be new land. There's not going to be uh, further degraded land. Hopefully we start to uh, improve that. So the challenge ahead of us is, is for real. And a few of the, the points that I, I think are also headwinds that's going to make it difficult for us is that our tools in crop protection are going to be limited, whether it be regulatory, whether it be government policy, um, the number of applications, the number of approvals of new technologies 
from yesterday's technology of synthetic chemistry will still be there. It will still be absolutely critically important, but it's going to be more difficult. The second one is our consumers want to know more about their food. They want zero residues in everything that they, they ends up on their plate. And their preference uh, for that is only getting to be more loud and more pronounced. And then the final, the, 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 the next is around shifting weed uh, and pest resistance. So as we use the same tools over and over again, the highlights, the opportunities for more resistance, the opportunities for pests to get uh, more uh, vigilant are certainly there. So we need more tools in the growers' hands to deal with that. And then we talk about yield and uh, abiotic stresses. And this is a, a philosophy that's really starting to take hold, not only in Syngenta, but in all the companies that we work with, is we've always approached agriculture from a biotic standpoint. There's an insect bothering the plant, let's take care of the insect. There's a fungi attacking the plant, let's take care of the fungi. Rarely did we step back and say, you know, maybe a healthier plant <laughs> might be part of the answer here to help the plant overcome some of these challenges. So that's what you see in this balance between biotic stress management and hundreds of years of building tools for biotic stress management to this advent of more proactive plant health associated and soil health associated technologies and where we, were, well, where we will aim our research capabilities. So low yields and challenge with soil and plant health are really an area that we're taking seriously and redirecting, redirecting a significant amount of our research dollars more towards those types of investments. And then finally, um, challenging economics. So anyone that's been in agriculture knows the volatility that we've been through over the last three years, let alone the last 10 or 15 years. That's not gonna disappear. So how do we put more tools in the hands of our growers to either deal with or overcome or even invite in some of this volatility in the way that they farm? And this one is the, uh, ooh. I don't know, it looks like the Chinese got a hold of this one. Um, but uh, what this is supposed to say, so this is a, a chart that uh, we've, we've uh, grown out. And what you see is on the bottom part is what the traditional, the orange part on the bottom, the traditional crop protection market. So this is traditional synthetic chemistry. And uh, that market is continuing to grow. And it's uh, grown actually the last two or three years as the market uplift and higher yields were needed. Um, that market went up. So it's not going away. What the green is in the middle is new technologies, new products, more digi digitization. Um, it's, uh, you know, what kind of tools might we have for uh, soil health? And then the top part, the yellow part uh, that you see is uh, the biologicals uh, business. So what we're going to see is a transition from almost entirely crop protection into something that looks more like new tools, whether it be digital tools, and on the top, the advent of biologicals. So this is a very significant reason why Syngenta is investing into this area. Hey, look, I, what I said was actually even right. So, uh, so the traditional CP, the new CP technologies and, and biologicals. So biologicals were uh, bet in about 2016 or 17 within Syngenta. The strategy review said this is something we really need to take a look at and, uh, and really get serious about it if we want to make a, a change in the future. So that was uh, the, the driver for increasing our biological footprint. And one of our first uh, efforts were, well, let's go find somebody globally that has been doing this well and has great alignment in three areas. The first one being science-driven. The second one being really based in sustainability. Wakes up every day. Sustainability is this little side. It is, it is, it is embedded into the core of the organization. And then the third one, and probably the most important one, is delivering value to a customer. So Velagro and Syngenta aligned very quickly uh, when, when we both got in the room and said, hey, our future would look brighter together than either one of us could alone. And that was really the start of this partnership. So I'll start with just a, a few highlights. Um, in 2020, in October of 2020 is when uh, Velagro and Syngenta had come together. Um, Syngenta's got more than 1,200 employees uh, globally, and that's everything from production um, to the field, which is our, our bio squad, which a lot of the team is here. I met many of them for lunch today, but these, there, there they are. This is the team that's out talking to growers every day and presenting uh, how these products work, work on the farm. And then I talked about science and this whole idea of GIA power. You see the, the brand and the logo there. But this is how do you bring deep science to an area that hasn't always had the deepest science? So um, 
our friends with Giuseppe Natelli, the CEO and founder of Valagro, in early as 2007, made significant investments in the Omex technology to understand, well, yeah, that product worked, but understand why that product works and how you can make that product work more consistently and what situation you can make it work better. So uh, the, we've, uh, from a research standpoint, we've almost doubled the amount of investment um, into research. And a big part of it sits in a brand new uh, site that we have in Atessa that is focused on plant health. Uh, top to bottom, that's what that team does scientifically every day. And then all the way on the right, and this is, um, I come from a commercial background, so I'm a little bit biased here, but this is where it all really happens. And this is the BioSquad team, which I think is so unique and different to, to Villagro and something I fell in love with immediately. And that being a team that is dedicated to go out and talk to the grower not from a, here's my product, here's the features and benefits, buy it please, but a, what is your problem? How do I understand how the technologies that I might have, or even my competitors have, that I can bring onto your farm to make sure that you um, have the right tools to overcome uh, the challenges of, of, whether it be climate control or climate challenge or uh, uh, you know, just managing a more productive crop. So it's been a, a really great uh, journey and uh, we're still on that journey. And it's, uh, it's going quite well, and I think we only have opportunities to continue to improve from where we are. So let me just uh, uh, highlight a few take-home messages that I, that I would like to uh, make sure that you take away from this session. And the first one is, you know, the way that we produce food is going to continue to evolve. Consumers are only going to become more demanding, remain to be demanding. And uh, this whole idea around safeguarding plants and soil health um, we think is really the next key to unlock science for the next uh, generation. Um, we are here for the grower. Um, yes, we care about the consumer and what the consumer wants, but we are focused on science that makes growers more productive, and that's where we'll continue to uh, remain um, and continue to focus. And then at the end is uh, we're consistently looking for the best ways to bring science to the market. Um, one of the most challenging <laughs> parts of my job is coming from a company, so prior to in between the farm and today, I spent about 25 of my years in the crop protection business. And one of the most uh, challenging things, um, I think, for me to, to, to work through is when you come from these large companies where everything's always invented here, um, to turn, turn that into a very collaborative approach. So that is one thing that I wake up and drive every day is not everything's going to be invented here. We need to be collaborative. There's a lot of really great science happening outside of our walls. We need to welcome that in bring that in and collaborate with the, with, uh, the best science in, in the world. So uh, we're trying to make that door as wide open as possible and assure that we are a good partner in that collaboration as well. So we look forward to continuing to build. We're on the, very early in our journey. Um, it's really good. I see Terry and a few other folks out here. It's really good to see our competitors in the same area, having the same vision, the same ambition to really bring biologicals you know, to the next generation. And at the same time, a huge thank you to all of the people that have been working in biologicals when I was still on that tractor to get us to this point. So uh, thanks everybody for the time. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and uh, wishing everybody a good rest of your conference. Thanks. Just for a few seconds. All right. Um, so first of all, uh, Corey, what I want to mention and I'm sure you guys must have noticed that um, what Corey did was not so much about Syngenta, but there was so much common ground for all of us. And that's something very important from your presentation, which I really liked. The second thing, what you said is very important is the customer centricity, which is farmer centricity. And everything really is, it stops and starts with the farmer. At the same time, you mentioned your competition, and I always say this. We are not competitors. You are so right. You picked on Cortiva and Terry and, and said, you know, they are doing some fantastic things, and that's exactly what we have to do. We are all colleagues here. We don't have to look at, oh, my gosh, what is going to be my market share? Come on, let's increase the size of the pies, and we all are going to service the farmers and work towards the food safety and food security. Once again, we are running a little bit late, so I won't have the time for Q&A, but Corey, you missed out on your, Corey had, has to go today uh, because he has been traveling for six, seven weeks, and <laughs> he was in beautiful country called India a few weeks ago. I saw your picture with nice turban. <laughs> and um, 
Cory was also part of the CEO panel for fourth, but now you have to promise me that you are going to fill that next year for the CEO panel, because this is a permanent uh, CEO panel we do, round table. So next year, no excuses. All right, thank you so much, Cory. <laughs> My next speaker, I don't know how, to I, how do I introduce my ex-colleague, my friend, uh, someone who is so passionate about uh, bringing bioagriculture. Corey mentioned about that a lot of us people, we were in crop protection business and seed fertilizer business. But my next speaker, Denise, is, has been always in sustainable farming. So uh, the only challenge I will give you to finish as quickly as you can, because I saw your slides. There are quite a few of them. Okay. <laughs> All right. Over to Denise. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. And advancing the slide. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hi. Yes. Thanks, Roger, for that. And uh, it's been really delightful to hear the speakers so far who are really having a very similar theme. We have some big challenges. We need to all be working on this together in order to get where we need to be. Because for us, uh, we're thinking about people. How do we have health for all and hunger for none as our vision? And for us that are working in agriculture, as I've been in my entire career since 1990, when I started in uh, biologicals and agriculture, it has a lot to do with the sustainability of our food production. Everyone has to eat, everyone has to eat, and we have to be part of the solution. As Corey said, it's a part of the climate change issue, and we need to figure out how to do this more sustainably. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some different aspects, and, and there are many different ways to approach this, but we will talk here about the ways that we're going to think about this. So, um, one of the issues is making food available to everyone. And so talking for a moment about what we can do in order to help smallholder farmers who are producing food in low and middle income countries for 50% of the population, having more uh, support in their ability to provide nutrition and food for people. And so in order to do that, we have several different types of levers that we can use and that we are using. We need to have big goals, which we do have um, as an industry and as a company, and then we need to have specific programs in order to carry those out and to reach these kinds of goals. So if we think about smallholder farmers, uh, we think about how we can empower these people in order to be able to provide food for the people and do it in a more sustainable way. And so th thinking about how we make tools available to them, how we can empower them with digital technology, um, how we work together with them as partners in order to help them be able to be more productive and uh, have less impact on the earth and really help them with getting those tools into their hands. And, and having very specific programs that we can do that um, where we can work together, for example, in the program we have with Better Life Farming, where we're really working with uh, specific countries um, including things like Bangladesh and Tanzania, Honduras, in order to have partnerships to help make tools available to the smallholder farmers, to help them be as modern as they can for having less impact on the environment, um, and having also uh, equitable income for gender equity and for uh, small and uh, income countries. So this is a specific program, and each of these initiatives we have are thinking about how we can help people's lives and also help agriculture to be more sustainable. We know the challenges. We've heard about this from every speaker. Uh, we have a lot of issues on biodiversity. We have issues on water. We have a number of different things, and we need to think about how we're going to address these different ways in order to feed the population that we have and have the least impact on the, in, the earth. So if we think about sustainable agriculture and we think about climate aspect and how we can help reduce greenhouse gases and what we can do for biodiversity and ecosystem and reducing the impact on the environment as we are increasing our productivity. So we want to really help growers and our customers in order to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas production. 
Part of that can be by being more productive, producing more on fewer hectares, as we've heard other speakers talk about. Part of having a specific plan is thinking about specific crops and country combinations where we can have the biggest impact and increasing that yield with, with genetic gains. So we want to look very clear, closely about countries, crops, how we can help customers the most in order to have the biggest impact because we have big challenges ahead of us with, to do with climate and we know we need to get there and everybody in this room needs to participate in that. So if we think about very specific programs, an example, for example, in Argentina, since we're here in, in South America, thinking about what we can do, what we can do with cover crops, what we can do with winter crops, can we have no-till systems, what's the crop rotation, how do we help uh, with fertilization strategies, putting these, places, these into place with our customers with our partners in order to help them have higher productivity systems, which we've seen happen, uh, where we're able to increase their profitability, helping them have access to income, um, but also getting more carbon sequestration with the processes that we have, increasing the production. So we want to have specific programs that help specific crops and countries to have the biggest impact on uh, climate. We, we have big goals. We want to be able to reduce with our customers by 30% the amount of greenhouse gas production. We want to be able to have higher production with less impact, reducing the impact on the environment. And I mentioned also the, the smallholder farmer initiative. So if we think about greenhouse gas emissions, we mentioned an example for, with, we had with Argentina. But a number of different aspects can contribute to this. And this was also touched on Corey's presentation, where he's thinking about all the tools. How do we put all the tools we have available for agriculture in order to really make an impact on reducing greenhouse gas emission? This is something very I'm personally passionate about. And every speaker that's been up here is very passionate about this. We need to do this with plant breeding, with precision agriculture. We have digital tools, cover crops. Microbes, that's what a lot of us in here are very interested in, or natural types of biological products, um, and thinking about how we can have no-till farming. So these are part of this, and one of the initiatives we have is a carbon initiative where we, we're working specifically with growers to increase the number of hectares where we're having no-till farming, and we're also having cover crops in order to have the, the better carbon sequestration with our farming as we're producing what we need to produce and making them profitable as well. We also want to reduce the environmental impact. And this is an area that for me is very important. And certainly working with our biological products in traditional agricultural systems is a way to affect this lever. We have other as aspects as well that we can reduce. We can have precision application. We have so many different kinds of technologies that are coming along that Roberto talked about, that different speakers talked about in order to have this impact. So changing our precision agriculture, improving our formulations, but really embracing biologicals. And as a group in this room, helping bring that forward in the way that we need to have this impact on agriculture. We have specific examples here as well in Brazil where we've been able to take a biological product and really reduce the environmental impact uh, by replacing copper applications, for example, uh, which is increasing the uh, microbiome of the soil. It's actually increasing the health of the plants with the citrus. It's producing more fruits for growers. So embracing biologicals into the production and making it a healthier system, healthier plants, in order to have uh, less impact on the environment. We have a number of different things. I'm with the Global Biologicals Division with Bayer, and uh, we have different areas that we can contribute to with our biologicals. We definitely can reduce the amount of chemical crop protection impact on the environment by replacing, for example, multi-site chemistry with biologicals, things that have less impact on the environment. Um, and that is specific solutions we can come up in programs for growers. We can work with microbes in order to help with our greenhouse gas as well. Not just having more productivity, which is one way we can use with microbials, but also coming up with biologicals that can help with reducing that greenhouse gas production and reducing the runoff, fertilizer runoff. So making nutrients more efficiently used in the plants, using microbes to do this and other natural products. 
And thirdly, we can really increase our soil health. Soil health is very important to this in order to keep the whole system going, as we also heard from several other uh, speakers. And microbes can really help improving the soil health overall. So we have a number of different specific initiatives. We have big goals, and everybody in this room needs to play a role. Because when everyone does something, we can really transform agriculture, and we can improve the planet while we do that. Because we need to feed the world and leave the earth a better place. Thank you for your attention. I had to run. <laughs> I just took the bio break. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise. Um, what you saw with Denise's presentation, once again, to save the time and keep my promise to my Pam, I'm going to give up on my presentation. But I will like to say that you have already connected the dots because I saw your presentation before. That's why I took the bio break. <laughs> so food chain, sustainability, at the same time, integrated crop management. You cannot be away from that. What I always say to people, don't try to be extremist. Just organic, just regenerative. Just chemicals, no. I think the best result will come when we have an inclusive approach and we say, let us do what is the best for the soil, for the farmer, for the consumer. That results into food safety and food security. And as per, as per the dictionary meaning of sustainability, anything, whether it is us, our soil, and our society, everything is only sustainable when it is surviving. So let us make it survive with the integrated approach. And that's what I got from Denise's uh, presentation and Bayer is trying to do a great job. And once again, I would say that in this group, the most heartening thing is that we have multinationals who as Corey was saying, they were selling pesticides for years, and it took us some time to change our mindset. But now I can say very safely, Terry, you will agree with me, that most of the companies, multinationals or medium size or the new innovators, they have realized that without integrated approach, without adding more and more natural products and trying to reduce the chemical load, this is not going to be sustainable. So this is how I will end it, connecting the dots, as I said in my talk. So this is uh, going to be, a, again, I call it, I coined it in Bayer, to be honest. Bio break means let's take a break for, and, and we come back with 4.30 with a very interesting session you do not want to miss. Do not take a longer break. We come back at 4.30 because we have assembled more than nine or 10 countries who are going to share with you the developments in the regulatory area, which I feel is one of the most important areas. It is hindrance in some area, it is supporting in some area, but unknown also in a lot of areas. That's why, thanks to Terry, he has been our chair and uh, trying to support this continuity from year after year after year. We are going to have two groups. One is going to be global. Another is going to be LATAM because we are in LATAM. And I will hand it over to Terry when we come back at 4.30. See you soon. <laughs>